Now when you're out here at the Mid-America Air Museum, you really want to go out back here on the tarmac and look at their collection of uh, military warbirds. Right here we had the uh, F-4 Phantom II, which was used in the Vietnam era by the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines in air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missions. But my favorite from that era is over here. What we have is an F-105 Thunder Chief. My dad was a squadron commander and uh, we lived over there in, uh, in Okinawa when I was young. And I remember these taking off in flights of four, sometimes 12 at a time, full afterburner, the whole island would shake. It was quite impressive. As the war started heating up, he took his squadron over to Karat, where they flew what they called Pac-6 missions into North Vietnam, including Hanoi. And he was also a wild weasel, which is this variant right here. And uh, the F-105 was originally designed for uh, the mission of uh, uh, del delivering nuclear weapons. Uh, in Vietnam, it was called to do a mission that uh, it wasn't designed for, which was delivering iron bombs at a low, relatively low altitude, so we lost quite a few of them. But that notwithstanding, is a fantastic aircraft and performed its mission well. Next, I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. He's an entrepreneur, and he has businesses and homes all over the country. His name is Randy Jackson. We went out to Fort Collins, Colorado to meet with him, where he has a business selling powered parachutes and training people how to fly them. Here's Randy Jackson. Hi, my name is Randy Jackson. I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. You can see the Rocky Mountains, hopefully, in the background. It's uh, fairly late in the afternoon, so we've got our daily thunderstorm blowing through. The weather here is normally very, very good for flying these things. In the morning, at least in the summertime, if you fly by 7 in the morning till 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you miss most of the thermals that hadn't had a chance to heat up yet. Wind normally is down, so you can fly pretty much uh, any day of the week at that time, and then you pretty well cannot fly in the afternoons. But then about 6.30 or so in the evenings, once the thunderstorms, the daily thunderstorms flow, fly through here, it, it calms down and it's really great flying and really that's the best flying. Typically no wind, it's starting to cool off so the thermals have dissipated and it's great flying. Have all kinds of scenery to fly, fly around here. Not just scenery but uh, animals, wildlife is, is everywhere. Just over the ridge here is a herd of deer, herd of antelope, uh, fox, coyotes. Coyotes are rampant out here in these parts. These machines drive them nuts. You get down off the ground about 10, 15 feet, and it makes the coyotes go crazy. So you can chase those guys a little while, and then they, they lose you into the woods, and so you go on to the next thing. My dad had a Cessna 172 that I used to fly with him. I never did have a pilot's license. I always thought my eyes were too bad, so I never even pursued that. I would fly the airplane with him, but he, you know, he was at the controls if there was any problem. Other than that, I've never flown a thing. I got interested in this sport about three years ago from a guy up in uh, Gillette, Wyoming. I'm in the mobile home park business, and we bought a mobile home park up in Gillette from a guy by the name of Kent King. And I went up to do our uh, due diligence with him, and he wasn't there. His wife told me he was flying his kite. And I thought that was rather strange. And I said, well, when will I be back? And he said, he'll be by in a few minutes. And so we did some work. And a few minutes later, I heard a noise. And I looked. she said, here he comes now. And I looked up, and here comes this go-kart coming by the house. And he came down real low, waved at me, and said, come on. So I followed him out to the uh, place the, where they were flying. He landed, and I had never seen one of these, had always wanted to fly, but my eyesight was too bad to fly airplanes, and didn't know, much, didn't know anything about these, didn't even know the sport existed. So anyway, he landed and uh, put me in the back seat and took me for a ride, and I was hooked, absolutely hooked. I said, what would it take to fly one of these? And he said, have you got an hour? I said, yes. So he taught me to fly. and. Uh, then some, the, the dealers that were in town came down and officially taught me to fly, but he taught me the basics, and it, just, it was just amazing. 
And from that point, I said, I've got to have one of these things. And then I thought, you know, if I'm going to fly one, I might as well sell a few and try to make a few bucks off of the hobby. This unit is manufactured by Six Shooter out of Yakima, Washington. It's called a Skyrider. It's called an SR7. It's a two-seater. Uses a Rotax 582 um, water-cooled oil-injected engine, dual carb, 65 horsepower. So it will fly a lot of weight. I call this low and slow, and if you don't want to go low and you don't want to go slow, this is not the sport for you. If that appeals to you, there's nothing any better. It's, uh, it's just the most fun thing that I've ever done, and I've, I've, I've not skydived, but I've done about everything else. It's just the thrill, I guess, of leaving the ground, and, and, and really, you're almost like a bird. When I first was started flying here a couple years ago, there's, over this ridge, there's a, uh, there's a creek and there's a bunch of cottonwood trees. And, and in those trees uh, are a couple of eagles. And the first time I flew over there, I was just in awe of all the scenery on the ground. And I looked up and there's an eagle on each side of me and they're just soaring with me. And we're about 100 feet off the ground. And if I went up, they went up. It was just incredible. You know, you, the, just the smell the wind hitting you in the face, it's, I don't know how to say it other than this, it's just the most free time I've ever had in my life. I am a uh, beginning flight instructor certified by a ASC and that legally gives me the uh, authority to train people, so I do that. I take people for rides as an introductory ride and an introductory uh, instructional ride, I guess is the best way to put it. And then if they want to learn how to fly, I teach them to fly. Typically I can have them airborne, if you have good weather, in an hour and a half to two hours. I've probably trained 50 people in, in a couple of years. And then, I, I, you know, as I said before, I sell these units. So that's a beginning, basically, of selling one of these. So typically a guy comes out wants to go for a ride. Then you teach him to fly and then they want to buy one. So I package it all together and then typically they'll buy one. As you can see in here, right now we've got one of those fronts coming through that I told you about and we'll have some rain come out of the uh, southwest here in a minute, but as you can tell the winds picked up. And that's one thing you really need to watch flying these, uh, the, this craft. If you can fly in wind, these things run at 20, about 25 miles an hour they recommend you don't fly over 15 miles an hour of wind. So you have to be real careful. And there are times where it's totally calm when you take off here, and then you go off south for an hour or so, and when you come back, the winds come up. So you, you want to be uh, a pretty, pretty serious about it and a veteran uh, pilot before you fly in that, because it can be a little tricky. Really nothing real scary, but you just want to use common sense. We've got some power lines over here to the east and to the north, other than that, it's pretty wide open, but when you're heading into the wind and you're looking down and going backwards, that's a sign that you probably ought to land. It's not a great feeling. What's I know I've flown in winds over 25. I had about five hours in this thing and was flying from the downtown airport with my buddy, Kent King. He was still really instructing me, and we took off. There was no wind on the ground at all. I got up about 200 feet, and it was like a jet stream coming through. And our whole purpose of that morning's flight was to leave from the downtown airport and come out here, which is probably eight or 10 miles. It took us about an hour and a half, and what I quickly learned in wind of that nature, you kind of have to tack back and forth, such as uh, you do in a sailboat. So anyway, when I, it had, the wind had to be coming out of the north, and we were coming north, and there were times when I was going into the wind and looking down, I was going backwards. So it was a little frightening at first, but once you get used to it, again, it's uh, if you use common sense and go into the wind and then just go back and forth, but keep edging into the wind, you ultimately get to where you're going. If it's blowing more than that, you want to put it on the ground for sure. The safety feature of this aircraft is one of the things that really appealed to me because I, I guess I like to think I don't live on the edge. I've got about 200 hours in this and I've never had anything even close to a close call. But I use common sense. If it's too windy or it's stormy and the front's coming through, I don't fly. But again, like the, uh, the time that I alluded to earlier, sometimes you're going to get caught in wind. 
and you just learn to deal with it. As a general rule, the sport is extremely safe. I don't know for sure if there's ever been any fatalities associated with strictly flying this. I, I, I have heard of one where the gentleman was uh, dead when the machine landed and the autopsy showed that he'd had a heart attack. I've read in a couple of instances and heard of guys tangling up in the power lines. Tower, power lines and trees are really the, the biggest things that you want to avoid. If, you know, if you're going along and you see a power line, you want to give it gas and go way, way over it. I don't want to take any chances. I don't know that it would electrocute you, but it would, you'd sure be hanging up there for a while until someone came to get you. And again, you want to, want to pay close attention to the big trees that are around. And if you're flying out where there's hills, you just want to make sure you're higher than the highest point. But overall, I, you would have to really have a lack in judgment of using common sense to wreck one of these things. Such as flying over an airport where there's traffic in and out. Uh, you know, you can't fly one of these within a five mile radius of a controlled airport but the airport that we have here in Fort Collins and the one further south at Fort Collins Loveland is not controlled and you've got a lot of airplane traffic in and out and so you have to use common sense as you're flying around there and, and you know watch what's going on. Normally I utilize a radio and I'm turned on to the frequency of that particular airport so I can talk to the traffic and I know where it is but when I'm around there I stay out of the traffic pattern and I stay low enough so I'm not in anyone's way. Well, I just like to get up in the morning when it's still nice and early and the sun's just coming up, say about 6 o'clock in the morning in the summertime, and take off. <clears throat> this is all irrigated property around here, so it's, uh, it's unbelievably green. There are lots of lakes. They're all connected with uh, canals because this is all irriga irrigated land. I like to just take off and just hover over the, take off and go over the, uh, the, the cornfields, 15, 20 feet above the ground. It's, it's just the most free feeling in the world. I love watching all for all of the, the wildlife. I often wondered how hawks and eagles could find so much uh, wildlife prey. And it's, it's incredible what you can see from the ground uh, 100 feet to 500 feet in the air. Just, it's just incredible. I like to go down over the uh, lakes where the, where the people are water skiing that's a kick because they always stop what they're doing. The most fun flying these things are flying with a bunch of guys. The camaraderie that's developed is incredible. We all carry radio so we can uh, we can visit as we're flying along. Out here I've got six guys that fly out of here and uh, a lot of times there are three or four of us flying at one time and we just take off and fly along and a lot of times we'll stop and have a little lunch and then pick up and fly again. But we utilize the radio to communicate all the time. Works very well. If you compare this to the other toys out there, I think it's a really good value for the dollar. With the advantage that you can fly all year long. Uh, this machine topped out with all the engine information system, the, large, the, the largest uh, engine, the parachute and the whole thing, is in the low teens. And that, that's a pretty good price when you compare it to what people spend on boats, motorcycles, uh, watercraft, snowmobiles. Out here, snowmobiling is a very big sport and, and four-wheeling is. The problem with either of those is you're limited to about uh, three to five, four months probably, four or five months, and then you can't use them. This sport you can do all year long. Frankly, it's, it's as much or more fun in the wintertime the scenery's not as nice, but the weather's better. You have a lot less thermal, so you're not bouncing along as you're flying along. Typically, the winds are not blowing like they do uh, in the summertime. So I just put on my snowmobile gear, put on my helmet and gloves, and I take off, and away I go. I don't have this one equipped with any kind of skis, and we don't get enough snow here normally for that to be a problem. But for the people that fly up in Minnesota and up north where there's a lot of snow, people, there are companies that make uh, skis that can be adapted to these and, and it works very well. So you can, use, you can use this all year long. Okay, when this machine comes from the factory, it comes basically in three components. All the tubes come in a big box and you have to put those together. It takes about 30 hours. The engine comes, it's Rotax, so it comes from Austria. 
uh, via, via St. Louis for this manufacturer. And then the parachute, this particular case comes out of Florida. So you get three boxes from UPS. It takes 30 to 35 hours to put them together. This particular machine does not come from the factory with this rear view mirror. And all that is is a truck uh, mirror, but we use this so we can monitor the chute as we're taking off. And that's the only time it's used. I like to be able to see the chute and see which, if it's straight, if it's falling one side or the other, and then I know what to do to get the thing fully inflated so we get off the ground easily. If you don't utilize this, then you're looking around all the time watching, you're not paying any attention to where you're going. And sometimes I've heard of guys running through fence rows and whatever, it doesn't, doesn't do so good on the machine. Joystick, and this is kind of interesting, when I've taken up uh, pilots, that guys that have their pilot's license, the first thing they want to do when they get in and get off the ground is try to fly by using this, and obviously all that does is control your direction while you're on the ground. You, you get all of your direction out of the right rudder and the left rudder, and, and that's all. You go up and down with the throttle. And as you can see, the red line that's connected to the end of this, well, you, you can't see it, I guess, from here, but it goes, it, it's connected to the trailing edge of the parachute. So if you can just uh, close your eyes and think that the chute is above you, and it's about 14 feet above you, when I push this forward, that pulls this red line down, which is connected to the trailing edge of the chute. That pulls the chute down, causes drag, and that's how you turn left. Do the same thing to turn right. And then you utilize these just like you do flaps on an airplane when you're going to land. Again, it's all done with the control of the, of the throttle, but as you're coming in to land, and you always want to land and take off straight into the wind, just like an airplane. Crosswinds can get you into a problem with these because you get the chute inflated. If you're going crosswind, it tends to want to pull it over. So if you're not giving it enough right rudder and know what you're doing, you could pull yourself over and roll. You have a built-in roll bar with this frame, but I would just as soon not do that. It could probably, you know, there's a good chance it could take your prop out, and that's about a $350 item. So again, common sense, if it prevails, you're going to be in good shape. This thing works basically like a pendulum as it's in the air. You know, you're, you're cruising along and, and this frame is right underneath the chute. And again, it's all controlled with the throttle. If I want to go higher, I give it more throttle. It pushes the frame out in front of the parachute, changes the angle of attack, and it climbs. If I want to land, I just back off on the throttle and good old gravity pulls me down. So you go into, when you're going to land, you want to come right into the wind as much as you possibly can. When you're a few feet off of the ground, you start giving it brakes and you just kind of do this easily. As you apply both of those, it pulls down the rear end of the chute, causes lift, and you just you bring it in nice, nice and smooth. I can tell you the first time, first two times that I landed, I didn't have the... Uh, didn't have this down to such an art and I broke a couple of axles. Hurt my pride I guess more than anything. The axles were not very expensive but I've got over 200 hours in this and have had nothing even close to any kind of an accident. To me the trickiest part of flying these is, is the takeoff and you just want to take off into the wind wherever you can and whenever you can. I can t and people that have any time in this can take off with crosswind, but you just have to be very careful. And again, if you utilize the mirror and you handle it correctly, you can get off the ground okay. When you land this type of aircraft, that's not as difficult as taking off, at least the wind conditions, but you want to be going into the wind if at all possible. I have landed downwind because the conditions uh, warranted it. But you're going a lot faster, and it's a lot harder on the airplane, and it's just a lot harder to, to land. And landing in a crosswind can be a real problem. And another problem with these things is even if you land in the wind, into the wind, and then the wind changes, you need to get the chute collapsed absolutely as quickly as you can, because if the wind's blowing hard enough, it will just blow you back, and then I suppose ultimately could roll you. So what I've learned to do and the way I was taught was just to deflate the chute by pulling both of these in, dragging the trailing edge of the chute down, and, they all, they, and then it fails. But if, if the wind is coming cross or too much, 
What I've learned to counteract that is just take one of these and pull as hard as I can. That do, will deflate that side and then the whole chute deflates and, and then, then you're okay. When you take off in this for the first time by yourself, you feel as though you're going straight to the moon and the first thing you think is it's going to fail, you're going to fall back to the ground. It's advertised that they are stall resistant, stall proof, can't happen. I'm assuming that that's the case. Uh, I've, I have read different places where they've done a lot of tests, not just this manufacturer, but all the manufacturers. And I think way back uh, several years ago, because the military's done a lot of testing on this chute, utilizing it this way, and they've been unable to get it to, to fail and to stall. That's a big difference from a fixed wing ultralight or these backpacks that these guys use. This parachute is 500 square feet. It's 40 feet from end to end and it's rectilinear. And I believe it's 27 different uh, cavities that the air is rammed into and then they're all interconnected. So it would take an awful lot to get this thing to fail. And again, I've, I've read where they've done tests where they've had half of these closed off and it still flies. So from that point of view, I feel very secure. And uh, when, again, when you take off, and a pilot especially, when you take off in this thing the first time, the first inclination is to back off on the throttle because you feel like you're going to stall the thing. And that's a, that's a big difference. But if, I've ne if you've never flown an airplane before, I guess you don't have that to contend with. I keep my SR-7 stored in this box. Need a little oil on this door. I only have one, one machine in here right now, but this box will uh, handle and accommodate two very nicely. This machine weighs about a little less than 300 pounds with no, uh, no fuel, which makes it nice and easy to maneuver around. I've got it in this, uh, this was a metal freight container that they utilize on ships that the man that owns this property has rented out. Two of these units fit very nicely in here. I've got a lot of junk, gas, oil, tools, and whatnot. But it'll, it'll store two out here very, very easily. I utilize a flatbed trailer when I'm going from A to B. Very easy to get up into the, into the trailer and I can pull them all over. I've got a project that I'm building up in Bozeman, Montana. I take them up there and fly from there. Taking it to Kansas City. Uh, Colorado Springs, up to Cheyenne, so I don't just fly from here, fly it all over, put it on the trailer and away we go. I can have, I can have this machine off of the trailer, ready to fly in probably eight to ten minutes. Very simple. The trailer just, you know, tilts, so as I back it off, it just boom, comes down. Find a flat piece of ground, put a windsock up so I can see which way the wind's blowing, and away we go. Very simple.